Hi, my name is Mia Mulder, and in this video I will argue against the concept of work itself. Remember at the start of this pandemic when everyone started making banana bread and everyone was picking up a new skill or started knitting? I mean, yeah, a lot of us are working from home, but have you noticed that there's been a market increase of people asking, are you staying productive? Are you keeping busy? Are you doing something? That's part of what I'm talking about, which makes me feel pretty bad because I've spent most of this time indoors playing Stardew Valley. Which according to lifestyle magazines and the productivity hype is a very bad thing. I need to stay productive. So let's find out how to do that. Well, most of these discussions are focused around work because that's something that most of us are doing or at least are expected to do for one reason or another. There is a social expectation to work and I want to talk about why that social expectation exists and why we do it in the first place. In the last couple of decades, there seemed to have been a rise in productivity discourse that the solution to most of our problems won't come from social change or political reform. It'll just come from working harder. Do you want to have a better resume? Why not start some side projects related to your field? Do you want to have more special skills? Why don't you pick up some special skills? You don't actually need a higher minimum wage. You just need to work harder, cut down on private hours, really put your nose to the grindstone and take night courses, get an education, become promoted. Just dedicate as much of your time as possible to being productive and you will achieve more results. So, one, is that true? And secondly, does it matter? Now this discussion around productivity is to the great majority focused exclusively on work, wage work, things that you can make money from. Because you know, the reason we do this is so we have food on our tables and a roof over our heads. And if we work to get that money, we can exchange it for these things. $20 can buy many peanuts. Explain how. Money can be exchanged for goods and services. <laughs> so I think that's where we should start. Why do we work in the first place? Now, personally, I haven't really worked that much in my life. Like, I haven't worked a real job, so to say. After high school, I went immediately to university. And after university, I spent a year being partially employed and partially unemployed, depending on the week. And after that, I went into YouTube, which, I mean, yes, it is a job, but I'm my own boss. So it's not really a typical job in that sense. Now, the reason I've been able to do that is twofold. One, I've been lucky enough to be in Sweden, where university grants are pretty generous. The government gives you money to study and educate yourself. And thanks to this, they allow me to focus on the important things, like partying and sometimes studying. I didn't have to work to pay college tuition. But at the same time, that also meant that I was always this close to becoming basically destitute. Student grants are generous, but they pay for, you know, rent and food. And that's basically it. And it turns out that being this close to having zero dollars in your bank account every month, it makes you miserable. The anxiety connected with being poor is, you know, real and obviously easy to understand. If for some reason one month I didn't get my grant, that's basically no money. And when that happened occasionally, I would spend some time living at a friend's couch because that's all I could afford. All of this was also happening in the early stages of my transition, which is more expensive than you'd think. So oftentimes I would have to ask strangers on the internet to help me out. I mean, that still happens today, but you know, at least now you're getting videos in exchange for it. Now, this situation is pretty typical. Out of uni, unemployed, need an income. A lot of people watching this video have probably been in a situation similar to this and probably know about the financial insecurity and anxiety that brings with it. And reasonably, the first thing to do here is find a job, get an income. And so that's exactly what I did. The first job I ever had was to become a recruiter for Greenpeace Sweden, where my job was basically to go around people's houses, knock on their doors and asking them to become monthly donators 
donors uh, to Greenpeace. I was basically asking them to go to Greenpeace's Patreon ahead of my time. And I worked there for about a week because the conditions were miserable. This was a side gig to my normal university studies, so most of the hours that I worked was usually in the evenings or on the weekends. I probably should have spent those hours studying or doing anything else, but it worked. I also did this job in February. It was cold, it was miserable, it often snowed and rained at the same time. I mean, generally it was just miserable. Co-workers were pretty nice though, but I quickly realized that literally none of us were there because we cared about the thing that we were doing. I mean, we were all environmentalists. We like environment. But none of us really wanted to be out there knocking on doors. It was clear that most of us just cared about getting paid or to have something on your resume before moving on to something else. Fellow YouTuber PhilosophyTube has a video talking about similar things, talking about bullshit jobs. A bullshit job is characterized by the employee not really thinking that what you're doing has any actual value. But I think that this is slightly different. Again, all of us were environmentalists. We cared about the planet, but we didn't want to be there to do that type of work. So even though we agreed with the general purpose of what we were doing, we were all still there just for a paycheck. And I think that's important. When you ask, for example, business magazines about why we work, they will often tell you that people work for a sense of purpose or a sense of duty or finding pride in the work, which is probably true in some cases. And there were co-workers who were very proud to work for Greenpeace, but they were still there for the paycheck. Without a paycheck involved, I don't think any of us would actually be there to do that type of work. I don't doubt that some people find joy in the type of work that they do. I mean, work is almost an entirely involuntary part of life. So I don't doubt that people would find joy in it in order to cope or a sense of purpose or whatever. I mean, yeah, we work for money, but we only work for that money so that we can get, as I mentioned earlier, housing, food, and a stable internet connection. So if the purposes of this video is anti-work, a lot of people will probably assume that I'm going to talk about anti-capitalism because that is what a lot of people instinctually react to when talking about why we work so much. I mean, don't get me wrong, I, along with a lot of people, will happily rail against capitalism as, a, as an ideology, but I think that's a bit of an oversimplification in this case. All sorts of economies and societies, even if they are anarcho-syndicalist communes or whatever, have encouraged and require some type of work. I mean, the idea of work is still something that exists and is actively encouraged by all sorts of economies. It has of course existed since long before capitalism existed as an institution as well. The motivations for work might be slightly different. Remember, I'm arguing against all work, not just capitalist work. In a capitalist society, the idea is to produce value, usually to your boss. You as a worker get compensated for your time, but any surplus value that you produce goes to the capitalist. I feel like I'm starting to sound a little bit like a Red Alert 2 character. All of the problems is capitalism. I'm escaping to the one place that hasn't been corrupted by capitalism. Space! But the goals of another economy might have different reasons for work. We still live in a society. Someone has to build up that society. Someone still has to farm the food, build the house. And someone has to do that work. And that is because work produces more than just profit it also produces product. And even if you don't care about the profit, we still need the product. So the truth is that work as a concept is universal, not just something for capitalist economies. And we don't really see any alternatives to it because it's a basic fact of life. But maybe we should start looking at alternatives to it, or at least start to undermine this foundational truth of society. After university and after Greenpeace, I managed to find my way into working in local government as an LGBT educator. My job was basically to go around various parts of local government and telling them that, hey, 
LGBT people exist. And it was a pretty okay job. Not too many hours, it was meant as part-time job, and the pay was okay. I managed to get the job because I had done some LGBT activism in Sweden beforehand, so that looked pretty good on my resume, and being an historian kind of helped with being an educator, or so I said in the interview anyway. And it's probably the first and only real job that I had. I had proper co-workers, I had a proper boss, I worked in an office, I had my little office laptop. A couple of days every week I would go to work in an office, and write documents and plans and teach, and that's what I would do. And for a short period of time, I felt great. I felt amazing. I had an income and I earned more money than I had ever done before. I could afford my own rent, I could start paying back student loans. Life, pretty good, right? And this is the ideal of how it's supposed to work, right? You get an education, you get a job, and suddenly you're getting into home ownership and becoming an adult. Like, and I noticed that I no longer had anxiety about money, because I had an income now, but I started developing new anxieties, new stresses, and slowly, over time, I started becoming more miserable than I had ever done before. If you go back and look at my very earliest videos, you can see that there's about a seven month gap between my first couple of videos and when I started making videos a bit more professionally. The reason for that is, at that time, I was becoming mentally exhausted, burnt out, as it's called. It turned out that my new job, while paying okay, was destroying me mentally. Now, I was doing this job as an educator, I felt that I was doing a pretty okay job. I did every task that I was given, and I was doing it proper. But there was always an expectation that I would do more than my assigned work every day. And the idea was that I was going to do this on my own accord, because I cared about the mission statement. And to be fair, I did. Being an LGBT educator was something that I was very, very proud of. I definitely thought that I was making a good contribution to the world, not a bullshit job. I had plenty of passion, I had plenty of drive, and yet, as I was trying to keep up with the demands of the job, I noticed that I no longer had any time to do basically anything outside of that one job. So a lot of my early creative projects, I had to cancel. Social engagements? I don't really have time, I have to work. Things like my own activism had to be put on hold, and the early stages of my YouTube career also had to be shelved. Because the thing I couldn't take away time from was my job. Because that's where the money came from. And so it came to a point where I was working almost full-time hours for this part-time job, because I had passion for the project. Just for one example, every day I was expected to check my email about every half hour even on days when I wouldn't actually work, just in case our boss tried to contact us. So even on days when I wasn't actually doing any work, I was always in a mental mind space of, oh, I'm sorry, I have to check my email. And checking my emails takes more time than just looking at my phone for half a second, because it only went to the laptop, and usually they would send 10 to 15 emails a day, most of which were completely irrelevant to me that I didn't actually need to read, but because they might be important, I had to look through all of them, maybe forward some emails to other people, but basically every half hour I had to interrupt whatever I was doing to just look at some emails for three minutes, which meant I could never actually do anything that took more than a half hour to do. I can't really go for a long walk or go to the movies or do anything during the day because I might miss an important meeting. At the very end of my stay there, I sometimes decided just to say, nah, I'm not gonna check my email that day. It's probably nothing important. I'm just gonna leave it and just rest for a day. I haven't rested in so long, I need to sleep. And on occasion, I would miss an important email and I would have to talk to my boss about it. And that adds to the stress because that meant I couldn't leave my work at the office. I was always carrying with me this mentality of being at work, which slowly, gradually drove me insane. You can hear similar stories from people who work, for example, in the gig economy currently. Or as a more commonly known example, warehouse workers for Amazon. It doesn't actually matter how much they're getting paid, or what the conditions are in relation to the work. The work itself is driving people into unhealth. The simple relationship between employer and employee means that those who work harder will have more secure employment so it's impossible to ever take away 
that feeling of always needing to perform more. For a short sliver of time in university, I didn't study history. I actually studied acting, well, theater generally. And during that time, I had a dance teacher. And he told me a very important lesson about health and stress. And yeah, I know, I took a year of drama. I have no rights, I'm sorry. During this time, my dancing teacher told me about a condition called the ballet sickness, which is where ballet dancers who injure themselves don't rest and recover properly until they go back to work. Because of the competitive nature of ballet, a lot of ballerinas stress themselves into coming back to work as soon as possible, so as to not lose their spot and not to fall out of practice. But what that means is that because they haven't rested enough and fully recovered, they are far more likely to injure themselves again and have to take even more time to rest and recover again. And the only way to break the cycle is to actually take a significant amount of time off and fully recover, which I think is something that you can usually only do if you're a wealthy Russian aristocrat or manage to take a very cheap drama course. But that's not really something that most people can do when it comes to any type of activity that they rely on for income. What I was experiencing was mostly psychological stress, but depending on your type of work, you may experience physical stress as well. And so in a world where productivity is hyped up in the way it is, you may drive yourself to physical or mental injury for something that might not even resolve to anything. But if you get injured either physically or mentally at work, there's not a lot of things you can do. We need that income. And another issue that I've noticed when people talk about these things in the discourse is that a lot of times people will blame the boss. And I know, like, everything is the boss's fault. That is, that is still true. I'm not defending a boss here. Obviously, in any type of work where there is an overseer or a boss, there is that added pressure of them bringing negative consequences to you unless you perform harder. But I don't think the boss is the original cause of this, because even people who don't have a boss also feel this pressure. Even today, stress is something that I carefully have to manage. I still haven't fully recovered from my time in local government because of the overwhelming stress I was experiencing at the time. But right now, obviously, I'm very lucky. I get to work on YouTube.se and I am my own boss, but I still rely on this type of work for my income. And if I don't make a video every single month, I lose income. And I feel like there are similar stressing factors. Like for example, if I make a video that is longer and more highly produced, that is more likely to get more views and earn me higher income. And if I decide to take a month easier to let myself rest more, I risk losing income. And so even without a boss, even with complete own creative ownership or ownership over my own work hours, I am still under control of productivity. A big reason why I'm making this video is because I wanted to make a video that's a bit shorter than what I usually do. Previously, when I tried to make shorter videos, they've ended up being almost an hour long, which is a lot of time. But I also work in super weird hours because some days I'll work maybe two or three hours and then other days I will work like 16 hours. Like I wake up and I get immediately to work and I work until I fall asleep. And that's like super unhealthy too. But I think it's important to say that the damage you take from work or productivity doesn't just come from the amount of effort you put into it. It is also taking a toll because of how little time you have for anything else. Despite the world having a huge focus on improving our own personal productivity, I think it's important to note that productivity has steadily been increasing almost every single year since forever. And there are a few reasons for that. And it's not because we are working harder than ever before. It's because of things like better technology. And it's not the first time that this has happened massive increases in productivity has historically been something that is good for humanity as a whole, but with consequences that I'm going to get into a bit later. The most famous examples is probably the agricultural revolution and the industrial revolution, 
where new technologies and social measures meant that the productivity of individual workers skyrocketed, which for society is definitely a good thing. I mean, say what you want, but I'm happy that we're all not farmers. But as society is becoming more and more interconnected and highly educated, it also means that change in technology is also increasing in frequency, which also means that the rate of increased production is also increasing. These shifts in productivity didn't end with the Industrial Revolution or with the invention of the internet. Every single day, there is a new thing that will increase the amount of work that an individual can do. This is due in large part to things like increased automation, but also because we have become better at planning what resources that we need, and also become better at things like distribution and communication. And because of these things, it's easier than ever to produce what we need. And yet, there is a focus on increasing productivity instead of increasing the time that we have. Why is that? A common discussion I hear often from America is that the reason why we get so stressed from work is that a lot of people are working multiple jobs or working too hard because of low wages. Which is definitely true, but I don't think it paints the full story. The idea of higher wages, or higher minimum wage, is that the employee would get a bigger share of the surplus value that they produce. Which is definitely a good thing, but I don't think that is what we should strive towards as an end goal. Recently, there's a phenomenon that even if you earn enough money to have a fairly okay income and a safe economy, you might not actually have the time to enjoy any type of benefit from that. One UK study discusses people being money rich, but time poor. This is where workers are earning a fairly decent wage, but that wage is being earned by basically taking up their entire day anyway. And that is because the time invested into work is far more than we actually think, especially when we have to expand the term work to include things of outside wage labor. I haven't mentioned these types of time investments because they typically don't fall under discussions of productivity, since the people who care about that are mostly bosses or industrialists who only care about the eight hours that you spend at work. But remember that the reason we work is to secure our lives. So everything that goes into that goal has to be taken into consideration as well when talking about time. First of all, it's getting to and from your job. This is probably the most common thing that people talk about, the commute. And you don't get paid for your commute. In fact, you pay for your own commute. And that is time that you are spending in service of work, but that you are not getting anything out of. You are not benefiting from that time invested. Similarly, we all have things to do in our daily lives as well. We need to take care of our homes, we need to cook, we need to clean. Obviously, there are errands that people need to do basically all the time, which means that when you factor all of these things into account as well, there aren't that much time left for any of us, especially since the standard workday is eight hours, and when we need around eight hours of sleep. Theoretically, this leaves eight hours for leisure, but that's not really how it works. To understand why, we need to understand where the eight-hour workday comes from. In the 19th century, arguing for an eight-hour workday was seen as basically as ridiculous as arguing for a four-hour workday today. Standard hours back then could be up to 14 hours long, and it wasn't until factory owners saw the benefit of the productivity of their own workers that they lowered it to eight hours. The reason why they did this is because factory owners realized that they could get more productivity out of their own workers each and every hour if they were well rested. But notice how we're framing even the idea of reduced work time in the narrative of increasing productivity. And obviously the 8 hour workday is much better than the 14 hour workday. But in the 19th century, some workers would still want to work more because the benefits of that productivity hasn't really gone to the workers, it still goes to the factory owners. Reduced hours give workers more time, but not more money or power. So when wages are too low, people will still willingly exhaust themselves, even though they have the right to fewer work hours. Also, this was a time when many workers were based on a one-income household, either living with parents 
or with their partners. Worker wives would often take care of the household and the household duties, but in today's world, that doesn't really hold up. An eight hour workday could work when you don't have a two hour commute and when you don't have to take care of your own home. But now that's something that most of us have to deal with. So eight hours is once again, too much time dedicated to work for us to be able to take care of ourselves. Now that's not to say that increased wages wouldn't help. They definitely would solve a lot of the problems that I'm discussing, but they wouldn't solve all of the problem. The problem still boils down to time because time is pretty important. For example, why do you think that the great artists and scientists in history were able to do the things that they did? For an overwhelming amount of cases, it is because the people who managed to do this great philosophy and art and science are people who have had most of their time left to them. I am somehow less interested in the weight and convolutions of Einstein's brain than the near certainty that people of equal talent have lived and died in cotton fields and sweatshops. If you don't have to cook your own meals or spend eight hours of the day working at something that you don't really care about, then that leaves you with a lot of time to do philosophy. Or as some philosophers say, make history. We must begin by stating the first premise of all human existence, and therefore of all history. The premise, namely, that man must be in a position to live in order to be able to make history. But life involves, before everything else, eating and drinking, a habitation, clothing, and many other things. The first historical act is thus the production of the means to satisfy these needs, the production of material life itself. And this boils down again to a more baseline discussion about what work actually is. So in order to have life, we need to actually fill those base necessities of work. Marx argues that we need to be housed and clothed and fed in order to be able to live life, which I think means that the ideal work is something that helps you fulfill these base goals. And I think that means the ideal profession then would be that of a mukbang YouTuber. I'm only doing this because of popular demand. Mm. There are a few theories of how to fix this. Some argue for a four day work week because reducing the amount of hours at the office doesn't cut down on the time of your commute. And some argue for more flexible scheduling and some argue for the six hour work day. There's also the concern that by reducing work hours but not adequately compensating with wages, people would be forced to take up more jobs. Once again, working multiple jobs in order to make ends meet. For many then, this work issue becomes a balancing act between time and money. And sometimes it feels impossible to make sure that you have both. So even if you want to reduce work, there's no real consensus for how to do that. But it should be noted that there's also an idea that we might not actually have to do work at all. Which sounds maybe a bit idealistic, but bear with me. <laughs> This used to be referred to as fully automated luxury gay space communism. And it was called that until people started saying there was unrealistic and idealistic. But what fun is ideology if you can't be idealistic about it, huh? And this sounds like a complete impossibility, right? How can we not do work? There's this idea in modern society that new inventions will eliminate some jobs, but they will provide new jobs in new sectors over time. But why? Why do we need that? Someone who is anti-work might argue that I don't actually need a very slight improvement in my quality of life. Like, I'm good where I'm at. I don't need gadgets to incrementally improve what I do. I need time. Think for example on how farming became automated. This could have meant that many of the people working in agriculture could have spent their time very differently. But what happened in actuality was that people flooded to cities looking for work because that is the society that they lived in. This mass immigration to urban centers looking for jobs was extremely detrimental to those workers, despite the fact that they could have shared in the benefits of that automation. Similar arguments can be made for modern day automation. 
as it stands right now, there's a huge panic about whether or not automation is going to lead to mass unemployment, when in reality it should lead to the mass freedom of time. This increase in productivity can be a godsend, but it can also be a curse. We today might thank the sacrifice of the workers of the past, that they went into cities to industrialize, and that the benefits of their labor is something that we have today to take advantage of. But if they had had a choice, they would probably have chosen to take part of the gains that they produced. They didn't have an obligation to us, just as we don't have an obligation to sacrifice our lives and our health and our happiness for the possibility that future generations could potentially sacrifice theirs in the industrial revolutions of tomorrow. Someone who is pro-work might argue that by forcing people to keep working, we produce excess value that can be reinvested. Value that can be worked towards bettering the whole of society, which is a worthy goal. And for us, in hindsight looking at history, it might be easy to think that this is a good thing. After all, we in the modern times live and benefit from the return of investments produced by the excess value of our ancestors. If we don't work more than we have to, then there is nothing left for us to dedicate to improvement. As we've seen, productivity keeps going up. But an easy answer of this would be, we're not actually seeing any return of that excess value. We see this all the time where people will defend capitalism as an institution because people are using iPhones or Twitter. The idea is that the current economic system is the one that has created the current technological benefit, which doesn't really fully make sense. The argument that they use, that has some logical consistency, is that by producing surplus value, that surplus value can be used to invest in new technological improvements. Technological improvements that can make your life better, as in give you a phone. Or at least invent a phone that you can use. And this is an argument that I think works, but only in a very, very surface level because people who make that argument then have to prove that that is the point of surplus value, which I don't really think it is. It's a common misconception that the current economic system is what is producing technological advancements, but technological advancements are going to happen basically no matter what economic system we live under. Take for example America, who is still dealing with problems like homelessness and starvation, despite being the richest country in the world. And so that benefit from return value doesn't actually exist for a lot of people. But there's also an argument to be made that even if work did all of the things work is supposed to do, that doesn't actually matter. And that's the idea that laziness is supposed to be a human right. While a lot of philosophers discuss work in the sense of how best to do that work, either in terms of overall productive growth or profit or whatever, there is a refreshing perspective from a Cuban-born French revolutionary Marxist called Paul Lafargue. In his essay The Right to be Lazy, he poses the idea that laziness is actually one of the driving creative forces behind progress. Lafargue criticizes the idea that work, no matter the format or ideology behind it, is inherently a good thing and argues instead that we should reduce the amount of work that we do as much as possible. Our problem is rather to increase our ability to enjoy our leisure time. We need to develop our created ranges of play. We need to learn what it means to be free from the drudgery of work. Up to now, our play has been modeled after the images of our work. Even in consuming, we maintain producer attitudes, or even worse, the dull and dutiful attitudes of factory work. We have to forget to unlearn the producer attitudes. We have to renounce efficiency and productivity as human attributes. We have to insist on our right to be lazy and just human. Once labor has been recognized as something to get away from, and leisure has been recognized as the legitimate and significant sphere of human endeavors, we might even expect those psychological changes which are just utopian dreams in the classical theory of socialism. Okay, all right, all right, all right. So what can we do about all of this? I can't really argue for anyone to not work because we need to work. And I can't really argue against 
dismantling the society that is forcing us to work, because if I did that, YouTube would probably demonetize this video. And it turns out that even I live in a society, for now. But what you can do is reject the idea that productivity is a good thing. And remember, not everything that you do has to have a financial purpose. You don't have to put everything on your resume. You should allow yourself to enjoy something for the sake of just enjoying it. And of course, you should dare to be lazy. Reject productivity. Return to monkey. <laughs> Alright, so despite the anti-work message of this video, this is still work. And in the spirit of that, I want to introduce the sponsor for this video. Skillshare. And you know Skillshare, they're an online learning platform with thousands of classes for creative people of all sorts. They have classes for you whether or not you're a professional or if you're just a novice, which I mean, I am in a lot of cases. Previously I have suggested classes on productivity, but that's obviously not going to fit in the vibe of this video. So instead I want to recommend Portrait Photography by Jessica Kobesi, where you can learn to shoot and edit photographs to make Instagram worthy shots. Obviously photography is a real job, but I don't want to work. I just want to take pretty selfies and that's basically it. And you know, good photography could help with that. Normally Skillshare is less than $10 a month with annual membership, but the first thousand people who clicks the link in my description will get a trial period of Skillshare premium membership. Hi, and thank you for watching this video. If you liked it, I would very much enjoy if you liked and subscribed, maybe leave a comment. They all help the algorithm. Uh, um, I like it when number go up. The vibe for this video was a bit more chill and I wanted to make it seem as low effort as possible. And yet it still ended up being almost 40 minutes long. I, I don't know. I try to make shorter videos and this just keeps happening. I want to thank all my patrons for supporting me doing this, for helping me do this as a full-time job. It is a dream come true, really, and I have only you to thank so much. And I want to give a special thanks to Aini Salmanen, Alice Wells, Alisa Crawford, Alki Historike, Amanda B, Ashley Kitchen, Athiet, Austin K, Autumn, Kara Rudolph, Catherine Stenson, Catherine Gutierrez, Corbasvir, Dana Ferguson, Daniel Collin, Emil Rutkowski, Emilia Clark, Phelan, Fox Kant, Fret, Hannah Richards, Jade C, Jane Lesby, Janelle Torgeson, Gareth Arnold, Jay Parker, Jim Sterling, Jürgen Danielsen, Joshua Analik, LPQ Silver, Lady Eleanor Provencia Lotzberg van Lockmont, Linus 2.0, Lyra Wardrill, Madison Jacob, Melwin Sowa, Michael Anderson, Michaela Morimer, Nia Pasaka, Nork 426, Pat, Filumien, Lemineux, Phobos 2390, Rose Brunton, Riley Knox, Salmon Moose, Sitzeries, Sophia Razan, Sonic Red, Thoris of Mir, Tiffany A, Treya Sage, William Fu Hussle, Vinder, Vivian Crow, Wolfgang the Grand High Exalted Wizard, and Soya Kant. Thank you all so very much. That's all you get, you animals.